Hi everyone and welcome to week two of Democratization Regime Change. This week we're going to be talking about modernization theory and the Game of Thrones nerdy analog is the common people or the small folk. Modernization is really focused on the attitudes of the mass public. And if you get lost in the weeds and you start getting confused by when we talk about economic development, GNP per capita, literacy rates and all that, just back up a second and remember that this is really about changes in human society. And so we're going to start off with a Game of Thrones quote from Jorah Mormont where he tells uh, Daenerys Targaryen, Daenerys Targaryen says, the common people cry out for their rightful king. And he responds, the common people pray for rain, healthy children, and a summer that never ends. It is no matter to them if the High Lords play their Game of Thrones. And that is such a perfect encapsulation of modernization theory. One of the big myths or mistakes that people make in thinking about democracy is they think that there's an inherent human desire for democracy as a system of government. That's a very arrogant Western attitude, frankly. Um, the fact is, the people want to eat, and the people want shelter, and they want safety. And for most people around the world, it doesn't much matter whether it's democracy or authoritarian. If, they, if they're living a good life under an authoritarian rule, they're happy. If they're starving, they're not happy. So let's start out with some basics. All human beings have two basic needs. They need food and shelter, and they need safety from harm. And any government that fails to provide either of those things is going to create pressure for regime change. It doesn't matter if a country is democratic and free. If the people are starving, they're going to want a different form of government. And again, that may sound really crude and blunt, but that is one of the best established facts that we have in this field. It's also why an economic crisis is the single most common trigger for regime change. Look at Egypt. The protest against Mubarak originally started as protest against police abuse of citizens, but it was an economic downturn that left a lot of college-educated people unemployed and unable to provide for their family uh, that, th that sparked the organized protest against Mubarak <clears throat> that eventually led to the transition to democracy in that country. And that was also true in Tunisia as well, which was experiencing an economic crisis. And so if you're looking at a long-standing authoritarian regime and is starting to go through an economic crisis, that's a really, that's a really uh, good sign that a democratization effort could be successful. It doesn't guarantee success, but it definitely is a trigger for it. So we're going to back away. We're going to come back to economic crises, especially when we talk about survival of democracy, but just keep that in mind. Modernization theory is really about human development. That's something we're going to get to take a deep dive into next week with the Engelhardt and Wellzell. But foremost among this is how does economic development change society and create demand for regime change? And it has to do with these basic needs. Let's back up and ask a couple of provocative questions that will lead us into the literature on modernization. What if the seeds of rebellion began decades ago? What if that explosion of protest and outcry and chaos that we saw that just seemed to come out of nowhere like the Arab Spring, what if that actually began decades ago or even generations ago? What if it began three generations ago and this was the culmination of it? We wouldn't notice that because we'd turn on the news one day and say, oh, you know, Tunisia protest and regime change. It seemed to come out of nowhere. But isn't it possible that that started a long, long time ago? What if economics shapes people's values and attitudes? What if democracy is rooted in long-term societal changes? What if God were one of us? That's the only time that I will sing this lecture. And sorry about that, I couldn't help myself. Imagine two different societies. This is another way to get at the same idea. Take a second and I'll let you think about it. Think about the first society. It's agrarian, it's non-industrial, and it's basically subsistence hunting and farming. People um, hunt, they farm in order to live. And you can see the pictures here of what this, uh, actually what this does look like. So take a moment, think about what life, everyday life, what would you, you know, you wake up in the morning, what would you do? You go to sleep in the morning, what are you concerned about? 
Think about what that might entail. Okay, now let's go to a second society. The second society is industrial, it's urbanized, it's a very modern city. Think about what your life would be like in this type of society as well. How, what would you wake up? What would you do? When you go to bed, what worries would you have? Hopefully you can imagine that life is very different in those two societies. In a subsistence society, in a, the agrarian society, you have to worry about things like rain, drought, weather, right? You have to worry about what the weather is going to do. Things you have no control over. Are there going to be locusts or other insects that come and, you know, destroy the land? In a modern society, you don't worry. If it's raining outside, you take out an umbrella. You work in an air-conditioned factory, for instance. You don't have to worry about the outside world keeping you from making a living. That's very different, and you have to believe that people have very different values based on those, you know, people living in these two different societies have very different values, very different worldviews. And that, this difference in the two societies is the heart of the Engelhart and Wellsville book that we're going to read next week. I want to introduce it here because it leads us into this week's literature, but uh, keep this in mind for next week as well. So again, just to summarize, these two societies, you'd have very different lifestyles, very different values, different threats. Um, in an agrarian society, you would have existentialist, uh, existential threats to you. If bad weather came in, you could die, or your livestock and your crops could die, and then you could die. In a more modernized society, that's generally not the case. Yes, people die, right? They might get hit by a cab on the way to work, but the weather is not the type of existential threat. And these two people living in these two societies are going to have very different worldviews and perspectives. This is the heart of modernization theory. And I just said that. This is the essence of what we're talking about. It is that economic developments create changes in society. It changes their attitudes, their worldview, and their relation to government. And that is what we believe can lead to demand for democracy. So this grandpa monster looking person, um, I just realized that's a reference very few people listening are going to get, and now I feel very old and sad. Anyway, this gentleman's name is Seymour Martin Lipset. Uh, he's considered the godfather of modernization theory. He wrote one of the most influential articles back in 1959 that is still cited today. So this is where modernization theory really began in the academic world. Um, I'll tell you, we're not reading, I, I spared you reading his article, not because it's not good, it's just very long. And I'd rather spend the video giving you the background on this so that you can better understand the readings for this week, the Javorsky and Lamangi, um and the other readings that we're going to talk about. So you should take really good notes on this part of the lecture. This is not something that you'll be reading. I, I can give you the, you can go look up the article if you like, but um, we're going to cover it in about 10 or 15 minutes and then you'll have the background. He was the first one to notice a relationship between economic development and democracy. Basically, what he noticed is that most wealthy countries were democratic and most poor countries were authoritarian. And he tried to explain why that was the case. So he noted that there was this relationship and he kind of pontificated about why this relationship might exist. Another way to think about it is with this graphic. He was looking for what he called the correlates of democracy. So you've got economic development and on the outside you've got democracy. But what's the process in between? Because economic development is not a causal mechanism. There's nothing about economic growth in a country that leads to democracy. There has to be something else that is the byproduct of economic development that then produces democracy. And so he was trying to fill in this gap, you know, what, what is contained in this arrow. That's what the crux of his article was. And he filled it in with four main factors. The first one is literacy and education. The second one is urbanization. There's industrialization. And there's expansion of the mass media. And these four factors were the ones that he highlighted. There were some others, and we're going to talk about those, but these are the, the big four from Lipset's theory. So I'm going to give you just a second to write these four down. Okay, we're going to talk about each one of these factors individually.
The first is education. Lipsis said that it creates a basic requirement for democracy. He quotes a famous scholar, Bryce. You don't need to write down the quotes, by the way. Just understand the gist of it. And Bryce said that, quote, Education, if it does not make men good citizens, makes it at least easier for them to become so. And the second quote from Bryce is that, quote, Education presumably broadens men's outlook, enables them to understand the need for norms of tolerance, restrains them from adhering to extremist monistic doctrines, and increases their capacity to make rational electoral choices. Whew, that was a mouthful. Basically, education changes people's worldviews in ways that make them more, uh, that they create more tendencies towards citizens rather than subjects. Education is also highly correlated with support for democracy, so the more educated you are, regardless of whether you live in an authoritarian or a democratic country, um, the higher educated somebody is, the more likely they are to support democracy. And it does this by changing attitudes about the role of people in government. In other words, through education, subjects become citizens. This is why at the very beginning I referred to democratization as a song of subjects and citizens, because this is the heart of modernization. How do people become change from viewing themselves as subjects to a crown or you know a queen or you know the authoritarian regime to viewing themselves as citizens who should have say within their own government that's part of education now it's important to stop here and recognize that Lipset never said there is a specific pathway in other words these four factors just all seem related however Another scholar that lives at sites, Daniel Lerner, he did propose, propose a rough outline, a sequence of events, if you will. And this sequence of events that lives at talked about, citing Lerner, actually became the template for almost all of the later democratization theorists. So this is important. Again, take good notes on this. And you will recognize this rough pattern, this template, in the Englehart and Wellsell reading next week. So here's what Lerner said. He said it starts with urbanization. Urbanization creates complex skills and resources that are part of an industrial economy. And he talked about occupational specialization. That's a big, fancy, long-winded word to mean something simple. In an agrarian subsistence society, people have to have a broad range of skills. They have to be able to use a spear, a bow and arrow, a black powder gun. They have to, you know, to be able to kill animals to eat them. They have to know a lot about the plant life in that area so they don't eat something poisonous. They have to know a lot about the changes in the weather pattern so that they know when to plant and when not to plant. They know, you know, basically when to take cover when there's a tornado coming. And they have to know how to build their own house. You don't, they don't hire, you know, if you're in a, an agrarian society, you don't hire a company to come build your house for you. You do it yourself. And so there's, you have to have a lot of different broad-based skills. With the urbanization comes an economic, uh, an occupational specialization. So one person might work on the factory plant making cars, and that's his job. He just he puts the bolts in the side of the car. Somebody else might make refrigerators, and they're responsible for putting the hinges on the door of the refrigerator. And that's a very specialized occupation. That's how they make their living. And then they hire other people to do all the other things, like build their house or you know, build their car. With this urbanization, this occupational special, uh, specialization, comes literacy. And this presumably helps people perform, quote, the very tasks required in the modernizing society. Basically, people learn to read and write and become more cognitively engaged and sophisticated. And from literacy results mass media. If you think about it, the mass media is designed to make money. It's a profit-driven industry, and if nobody can read, then there's not much of a market for newspapers now, is there? So with literacy comes the demand uh, on the demand side for mass media consumption that creates a newspapers, a radio, movies, which creates, quote, the institutions of participation. Basically, it primes people towards voting behaviors, not necessarily voting in the political sense, but they can choose which newspaper they want to read. They can choose which movie they want to see. And so it creates an independence from nature, and it creates an independence of thought that results in a mass media, and all of this process then changes people's attitudes and values within society. At least 
that's Daniel Lerner's and Seymour Martin Lipset's proposed theory. Now, I'll tell you, I should go ahead and note, this is not the model that people use today. Scholars have built upon this and have advanced this, but this is where it started, and it's important for us to understand uh, sort of the, the beginnings of modernization theory so that we can understand better the later work that's come after that. So just to summarize this process, basically participation emerges from modernization. Lipset did talk about a couple of other factors or correlates. He talked about class struggle, income inequality, and civil society, what we sometimes call mass society. And we're going to walk through each one of those, especially income inequality has become a very popular theory to explain um, modernization or in particular uh, why some countries that undergo modernization do not become democracies. It's one of the explanations for the lack of democracy in the Middle East, frankly. So, and that's something we're going to talk about in later weeks as well. But it's important to understand that all of this was in one article written by Lipset. So let's take each one of these in order. First of all, class struggle. Lipset quotes Tocqueville says, only those who have nothing to lose ever revolt. And this is why a lot of times scholars refer to the working class as a revolutionary force. The middle class, the bourgeois, if you're talking about Karl Marx terms, um, is involved in moderate conflict, where moderate parties are preferred. They don't want radical leftist parties, and they don't want radical right-wing parties. They, they want more moderate and stability for their situation. So a higher middle, a larger middle class often will produce democracy as opposed to more radical ideologies like fascism or communism. In poor countries as well, a lot of times the upper class view the lower class as vulgar and inferior, and here's some quotes from Lipset again, you don't have to write them down, just get a sense of it. He says that the upper, upper strata also tend to regard political rights for the lower strata as essentially absurd and immoral. The upper strata not only resist democracy themselves, but their often arrogant political behavior serves to intensify extremist reactions on the part of the lower classes. So basically, if the lower class is a revolutionary force, then the middle class will be a moderate force. And if you have domination by the upper class, then you're going to often get one extremist form of authoritarianism. If the lower class, if the, the working class of labor rebels and takes over, you're going to have a radical leftist um, ideology governing. It's also going to be authoritarian. And it's the middle class that really can help predict democracy. That is also a controversial concept um, that's rooted in Marxist theories. We're not going to talk about it too much because there, I think there are better explanations, but I just wanted to introduce you to this. Income inequality uh, results in, quote, receptivity to democratic political tolerance norms. That's also a mouthful. If you want to try to understand the role of income inequality, it gets, it gets really complicated, but it can be summarized pretty simply. Wealthy people want to keep their stuff. And anything that threatens to take away their stuff, they're going to oppose. So basically, if you have a lot of wealth in a country concentrated in a small group of very rich elites, then a transition democracy threatens their stuff because the people will take over, vote in parties that will increase taxation and take away the rich people's stuff, and the rich people have more to lose. If you don't have high inequality, if the wealth is spread about evenly across everybody, then the wealthy, you know, even the people who have a little more money, they're not going to lose a lot. You know, you can't tax, there's just not as much there to take away from them, and so they'll be much more open to a transition democracy. This notion of income inequality as a causal mechanism has created quite a lot of debate uh, in the academic scholarship, and it's one of the more powerful explanations. And again, we're going to talk about this uh, when we get to the inhibitors, Act 3, the inhibitors of democracy. But here's some quotes from Lipset. Again, you don't need to write these down, just you know, gives you a sense of what we're talking about. He said that, quote, if loss of office is seen as meaning serious loss for major power groups, in other words, wealthy people, then they will be readier to resort to more drastic measures than seeking to retain or secure power. Basically, if the wealthy people fear losing their stuff, they're going to use authoritarian and especially oppressive authoritarian methods to keep their stuff. They're not going to hand power over to the uh, mass public who's going to take their stuff away. 
So, again, just to summarize, wealthy, powerful prefer authoritarianism if democracy means they're going to suffer greatly via taxation or redistribution of wealth. According to this theory, one important note, I'm not telling you that this is the facts. I'm laying out the theoretical explanations, and what we're going to do the rest of the semester is assess the evidence in support of these different explanations. I just want to make that clear. So civil society or mass society, is these, this involves organizations that help recruit participants in the political process. Bowling leagues, for instance, get people involved and in working together as a community to solve problems. So you need voluntary organizations in society that are independent of state power, and the more a society has these independent organizations, it doesn't have to be political organizations. It can be soccer clubs. It can be you know, any type of organization where community members come together and engage in collective action. This is very much an economics theory from rational choice. But when you have a lot of these, then you have a citizenry that is better prepared to participate in democracy, which requires that same sort of organization. That's basically the idea behind civil society theory, is that it trains people how to be democratic. One of the explanations for why democracy stuck around so long in America was the existence of these this civil society and the fact that American colonists already had some training governing themselves at a local level. So that's where this school of thought comes from. We'll go through some more of this. Basically, civil society can help recruit uh, participants in the political process. They help serve functions of democracy in several ways. You don't need to write this down, by the way. Um, again, this part of it is just some background, but basically some of the functions they serve is they're a source of new opinions. They're a means of communicating ideas, particularly oppositional ideas, to the citizens. They, quote, train men in the skills of politics. They increase the level of interest and participation in politics because it gets people more involved, uh, generally speaking, in the community, and politics is an extension of that. And people who are involved in this are more likely to hold democratic opinions and more likely to participate in the political realm. Now, let's talk about the later theory. Most of the work that has come after Lipset has had an unfortunate tendency to focus only on one part of Lipset's work. So take one thing and study it as though that were the only thing he ever talked about. And so, for instance, you'll see a lot of studies out there about the effect of civil society on democracy that doesn't talk about anything else. You'll see a lot of work on uh, fleshing out the role of education in promoting democracy. You'll see a lot of studies on inequality and only the role of inequality in democracy. The reality was Lipset wasn't focused on any one thing. He was saying there's a broad, this is a big theory. There's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot of factors. It's not just one thing. And it'll give you a sense of the complexity of modernization theory. Other scholars, uh, particularly Samuel Huntington and Barrington Moore, came along and tried to piece all this together into a causal chain. And they were more or less successful. This is also, by the way, what Engelhart and Wells all try to do in the book that we're going to read next week that I keep alluding to. But, and so keep that in mind. It's trying to piece together the long causal chain between when the economic development starts and when democracy is produced. It's important to note Lipset never, ever said that the relationship was deterministic. Other scholars have said that. Lipset never did. Remember, he's looking at the correlates. He never said, if you have this sequence, you will always have democracy. And that's a mistake that you know modernization theorists have been criticized by trying to cast this as too deterministic. When you read the Javorsky and Lamangi piece, that is their criticism. They actually kind of taunt modernization theory uh, by saying that it claims that democracy is secreted from modernization. Well, that's something that Lipset never said that. If you read the article, that's nowhere in there. But Huntington, Barrington Moore, other theorists, they did. And they argued that democracy is an inevitable consequence of this long causal chain resulting from modernization. They were wrong. Um, nobody seriously believes their work right now because it was too deterministic. They were also criticized because... They relied way too heavily on small case studies. Huntington, in particular, came up with this these three different pathways, one to democracy, one to communism, one to fascism, that said that every country always follows this particular pattern, and he based it on a 
on examination of five countries. So, you know, it was this work in the 60s and the 70s. It's really outdated, and we're not going to cover it. We're not we're certainly not going to read it. Um, but you should be aware of it. Uh, and it, because, again, it sets up the Engelhardt and the Wellzell uh, book, which does not cast the process as deterministic, cast it as probabilistic, and tries to piece together a long causal chain. So, nonetheless, despite the criticisms of these later theorists, they did provide some very important contributions. First of all, they focus on society and attitudes and how those things change over time as a result of economic development. That is the heart of modernization theory, and so they emphasize that. And they also look for causal mechanisms that could later be tested empirically, and that's where we're going with the rest of the semester, is that they highlighted some possible causal mechanisms that we could then go in and say, okay, these three, for instance, causal factors, these are uh, have a strong relationship, and these others just don't explain very much. So that's the background on modernization theory. Let's talk about the readings for this week. Sorry, I know you're probably getting sick of hearing of this. I do have to reiterate, this lecture is an overview. It is not a substitute to actually reading. You need to read every one of these articles. Unlike last week where I told you you can kind of skim through Huntington very quickly um, and skim through parts of Markov, this is one that you're going to need to want to sift through. Uh, the reading guides are very helpful, and this I hope this video is helpful for focusing you on in on the most important parts. So, Javorsky and Lamanji, they test Lipset's claim that modernization is related to democracy, and they make a really important distinction between what they call endogenous democratization and exogenous democratization. They're big fancy words. They really are simple to understand. Endogenous is Lipset's theory. It's the notion that democracy is secreted from modernization, that modernization happens, democracy comes out as a result of it. The exogenous is Javorsky and Lamanji's alternative approach. They argue that democracy is actually established kind of randomly. It's established independently. So, for instance, Tunisia transitioned to democracy, and so did Egypt. But those two things were completely unrelated. Egypt's transition had was in no way related to Tunisia's uh, transition and certainly wasn't as a result of modernization. They just kind of randomly popped up. And however, Bahrain did not transition democracy. It's still an authoritarian regime, same with Iran. And so the rise of democracy or the transition is based on idiosyncratic factors unique to each individual country. So transition is random, but according to Javorsky uh, and Lamanji, the exogenous part is that once, a, once an authoritarian regime transitions to democracy, it's much more likely to survive if it's modernized. That all the things that Lipset talked about with modernization are really explanations for which countries survive as democracies and which revert back to authoritarianism. That is Javorsky and Lamanji's um, point, and that's their main, that's the main crux of it. So you, when you read, pay really good attention to that distinction. You can think about it graphically like this. You've got economic development does not lead to a transition democracy, but it does lead to survival of democracy. This is probably the simplest way to understand uh, the big picture view. Again, you have to go read it to really understand these uh, endogenous, exogenous uh, processes much more in depth, but the arrow with the red X over it, that would be the endogenous democracy, and the other arrow would be exogenous democracy. Democratization, sorry. <clears throat> so again, Javorsky and Lamanji, they say economic development does not lead to transitions, as Lips has said, but it does lead to survival. And hopefully this can, you can see why this would create the pattern that Lips had originally found, which was most of the democracies are wealthy and most of the authoritarian countries are poor. It's because on you know poor countries do transition democracy all the time, but once they transition, they just don't survive. They revert back to authoritarian, so the only countries that survive as democracies are going to be wealthy countries that are modernized. All right, let's move on to Bois and Stokes. They actually, this is a direct response to Javorsky and Lamanji, and so you should read this article second, not first. It won't make any sense if you read this first. Um, they cite methodological concerns that you really don't need to know. 
But the most important part of this article is that they show there is actually evidence for both endogenous and exogenous processes. Uh, they correct some of what they uh, claim are methodological flaws by Javorsky and Lamangi, and they find evidence for both of them. Now, all of the figures in this article are important, but figure five is probably the best summary of their findings. If you start reading it and you get lost in the weeds, back up, go to figure five, take a look at it, and that hopefully can clarify it. So basically, to summarize these two articles, you've got Javorsky and Lamont, you come along and say, lives it was wrong, modernization doesn't lead to democracy, but it does lead to survival of democracy. Boan Stokes come back and say, nah, -uh, and show that evidence that both processes are true. I want to stop for a second and make a quick note. Remember when I said that this material is cumulative? This idea about modernization being related to survival of democracy, well, we're going to come back to this in the last week. This is the basis for understanding which countries survive versus not. We're going to add some different uh, factors on top of that, but this is the core for the last week of class. So again, make sure you understand this. This is important stuff. This might be some of the most important uh, literature in this field. All right, let's go on to the third reading. Witcher, Bumba, and Dude. Um, I'll tell you, I kind of suck at names. I'm not good at names at all. I, I'm going to butcher both of those. Um, and so I'm just going to start calling them W and D. So W and D or W and Dude or Witcher and Dude, they don't present any new evidence to rein in on this debate. What they provide is simply an overview of the debate. And it's a really good overview. And this is why I recommend you read it after reading Javorsky and Lamangi and Bois Stokes. Um, the most important part of their discussion is the debate about causal mechanisms, where they talk about, for instance, income inequality as a causal mechanism. They talk about political attitudes as a, or you know, values and attitudes as a causal mechanism. So pay really a good attention. They're going to talk about methodological stuff as well. Skim over that. You don't need to know that. But there's that section on the causal mechanisms. Pay really close attention to that. Take really good notes because, again, that sets up a lot. The, the, all the material for the rest of the semester is right there. It's also They also provide a really nice summary of Lipset's ideas. And so after this lecture, if you want to take another look at Lipset's original theory, they lay it out really nicely as well, and they have a nice graphic in there, so it's a good refresher on all of this. Finally, the article you should read last, and I'll go ahead and tell you it's okay if you read this article over the weekend. Um, we're not. This article is not going to be part of the discussion um, that we're going to have, but I wanted you to read this article before you read the Englehart and Wellzell, and by the way, it's the same Wellzell from that book. It's the same author. He just wrote his own article this time. This one focuses solely on attitudes because, again, if you think about the heart of modernization theory, it's all about how people's attitudes and their values change with economic development. And so he looks at which atti attitudes specifically are the most correlated with subsequent, uh, subsequent democracy. In other words, the people develop this attitude year one, and a few years later, what's the probability that there's a democracy? And which attitudes best explain that? So the most important part of the Wellsell article is to know the distinction between what he refers to as democratic preferences, communal preferences, and emancipative attitudes. I'm sorry, communal attitudes and emancipative attitudes. Know that distinction. Know what each one of those three are, and also know which one of those three has the biggest effect on subsequent democracy. Um, give you a hint, diagram 1.1 on page 405 is very, very helpful for that. You can look at the size of the bars and immediately see which one of those has the biggest effect. So, again... We're going to come back to this, and this Wells article is going to be very important for the second project, which is not due this week, but is due the week after. And so I do want you to, uh, to pay attention to it, but you can, you can kick this down later in the week if you, you know, need time to focus on the other three articles first in preparation for the discussion. Go ahead and do that, and then read Wells you know, later in the week or over the weekend. That's fine.
And that's it. That's the introduction, overview of modernization theory. I hope it wasn't too painful. I actually think this is some of the most interesting stuff because it's rooted in the human condition and the very notion that the revolution that we saw on television in Tunisia, in Egypt, in these other countries that just seemed to come out of nowhere, the idea that they actually might, that those revolutions might have started three generations ago as a result of economic modernization, I think is really interesting. And a couple of other questions, and this will probably come up in the discussions, which is if modernization and economic development increase the probability of a country transitioning to democracy, think about the implication that might have on foreign policy. Because one of the uh, more controversial tools that are designed to try to get countries to democratize are economic sanctions. This was certainly the case with Iraq before the uh, Iraq war. This is certainly the case with North Korea and Iran. We always talk about economic sanctions as a way to try to get them to liberalize. Modernization theory kind of calls into question the efficacy of that because if this economic sanctions destroy the middle class and result in, you know, in a backslide of economic development, then maybe they're doing more harm than good. I'm not saying they are. I'm not saying they're not. I'm saying that's something to consider as an implication, a real-world implication of this research into how we think about promoting democracy abroad to the extent that we care about doing that. All right, that's it. Uh, it's the only lecture for this week, and next week we're going to pick up on Engelhart and Wellzell's very good, very long theory, and see you in the discussion. Have a great week.